you ever spoken at an international conference, you've just flown in and you've got jet lag, you'll know how I'm feeling now. I've just arrived back from Malaysia this morning and I'm feeling slightly jet lagged. So I'm going to talk about the air that we breathe and the quality of indoor air in our buildings, not a rant about smoking. So we spend about 90% of our lives indoors, or North Americans and Europeans do. So the quality of the air in our buildings is important to the quality of our lives and the length of our lives as well. And so there are many pollutants that might be created inside buildings. In extreme cases in Africa, about a half a million people every year die because they use solid fuels inside their houses. That's an extreme case, but more closely to home, building-related illnesses are also a problem for us. Asthma, Legionnaire's disease, carbon monoxide poisoning are well known. Others are chemical sensitivities that cause breathing problems from the chemicals that we introduce into our buildings. As you'll notice in this building, as we create more energy-efficient buildings, this becomes more of a problem. So here's some sort of stats, um, asthma-related issues, about what, three people every day die in the UK related from asthma illnesses. About uh, five and a half million people in the UK have asthma or asthma-related um, conditions. So contributing factors to our indoor air quality, the chemicals that we introduce, volatile organic compounds, relative humidity, carbon dioxide that we breathe, radon, natural occurring gases, we can control these if we design and use buildings appropriately. The reason why it's become more and more of a problem is our buildings are so energy inefficient and to improve them leads to problems with indoor air quality. About 25% of the carbon that we emit comes from the operation of our homes. So the modern or the low energy house of the future is going to have very, low, uh, very high levels of insulation excellent perform windows, windows that probably have better insulation qualities than the walls in the houses that you live in at the moment, and are going to be airtight to stop the loss of energy and heat. And one particular scheme that we're going to see more and more of, created in Germany, certification scheme, the passive house might see our energy bills reduced from about £1,000 a year, maybe to below £100 a year. So a lot of added on benefits from this. This is the passive house for a photograph, which is uh, air an air tightness test where you pressurise the house to 50 pascals and measure how much air you need to pump in to maintain that pressure. This is about 20 times uh, more efficient than most houses that we live in. Um, improving indoor air quality, well, one of the best ways of improving it is not to put the chemicals there in the first place. But we introduce chemicals into our buildings, sometimes unwittingly. Uh, another way is to improve ventilation but that's a, a difficulty with low energy buildings. This is the Hempod. We introduced a piece of furniture from a well-known Swedish furniture manufacturer, <laughs> and within one week, the VOC levels in that airtight building exceeded World Health Organization levels in one week. So our uh, strategy is to use four different approaches, to use hydrothermal building materials, to use a vapor permeable fabric or walls, to use VOC capture materials and to use photocatalytic coatings. So first of all, hydrothermal building materials, what are they? They're materials that respond to airborne moisture to relative humidity and buffer that humidity to control it passively. Materials that we use like clay, timber and some natural insulation materials are well-known hygroscopic materials. This graph here very quickly shows how the internal, the solid lines, the internal space of this building here, built of hemp and lime, how the internal temperature and humidity are controlled whilst the external uh, dotted lines are fluctuating over a 24-hour period. This shows the Goldilocks zone, that if you can control the humidity between the 40 and 60%, then you control many of the agents that are detrimental to our health through indoor air quality, such as bacteria, viruses, mites. Um, one of the interesting materials that we can use uh, for VOC capture is sheep's wool as a natural fibre insulation material. Wool will capture and store VOCs. So we're seeking to exploit this uh, characteristic more. And here's sort of demonstration of that. This is a graph uh, of change of humid relative humidity with the wool, with and without formaldehyde inserted into the atmosphere. So you get a net weight gain with the formaldehyde, the VOC, in introduced. We're also going to use photocatalytic coatings uh, which take light energy and turn it into chemical energy to treat pollutants within the air. That's our approach. The, the challenge is to do it in an internal environment where the UV light levels are much lower. So there's lots of things we want to do to create healthier buildings through a healthier fabric and to do that we need uh, to collaborate with chemists, with physicists, with biologists, 
with mathematicians, etc. And so this is really a call to arms to collaborate to help us achieve what we want to do. Brought to you by the power of Red Bull. <laughs>